so we're all connected. I'm going to share with you a personal story of how Facebook found my lost luggage when Air Canada couldn't. I was traveling from Vancouver to Toronto, this is about a year and a half ago, and February. I was going ultimately to Montreal, and then I was going over to see a friend in Ottawa. So I was going on business to Montreal, stopped off in Toronto. Probably the first mistake I made was booking a flight via Toronto in February. We flew in in the middle of a massive snowstorm. I don't know if you know the 401, 16 lane highway, it was down to two little tracks and I knew instantly we weren't going to be going anywhere soon as soon as that plane went down. Sure enough, 12 hours later I was off to Montreal. The key here is I had my business carry on, no problem there, but I had with me a bag of skates and winter gear for my, my next step off to Ottawa. So I was planning to uh, spend some time with a friend and go skating on the canal. That bag was missing in action. So here's the flight board. You can see there's a lot of cancelled flights. That plane was not going anywhere anytime soon. So I boarded my plane off to Montreal without my bag, filed my claim. Got to Montreal, went to the first day of the conference, came back to my hotel room, and what did I do? I go on Facebook. Okay? So on Facebook, there is a big discussion that has broken out amongst my friends. A friend of mine had flown 12 hours later from Vancouver to Toronto and it had encountered hundreds of bags abandoned on the carousel. And she took a photo and she posted it on Facebook. Of course, all my friends knew my bag was lost and so they're all speculating, could this be Mary Charleston's bag? <laughs> and I took it and I zoomed it in and I thought, oh my God, there is my bag. I knew I tied the handles together. I knew the distinguishing marks. So of course, what did I do? I called Air Canada. I said, very excited. I found my bag. It's on Facebook. Well, you can imagine how that went over. <laughs> <laughs> so I called back and I reframed the story about an hour later. I said, I found my bag in a rather unconventional way, and I want to make you the hero of my story. <laughs> and proceeded to tell them where it was and how they could help me. Now, that bag did not make it on the plane to Ottawa, but it did eventually find me in Ottawa. It was still marked unclaimed, unaccounted for in Air Canada, but when I got to the airport in Ottawa, they said there was a note attached to my file that said there was a bag that had been loaded onto the plane. I knew that the person who I talked to was part of that story. I was no longer a faceless Air Canada disgruntled person, I was the person who had a really unique story that they could become part of. That's the power of connections. The power to connect my friends on Facebook through mobile devices, to take the photo, to connect it together, to give a story to share. Now you're going to say, how does this relate to marketing and sales? Well, of course, I wrote about it. I wrote about it on my blog, wrote about it on my e-newsletter, I got picked up by Carrie Adams on CTV. What a great story. Facebook found her luggage and I was able to leverage it even more for my own positioning and marketing. So the, the key there is storytelling, wrapping it in a storytelling, um, a story that people will care about and then sharing things through social media. I use this as an intro story because it was I've, I've used it in my book. It's the first story of word of mouth, mouse mobile. I use it as an intro story on my talks. Who knew that losing a bag through Air Canada could give me so much mileage? <laughs> I should probably thank them in some capacity. So give people a reason to tell your story. You can use that in your businesses. You can use that with, uh, you know, trying to leverage social media. Uh, for sales. It's not all about you. Give them a story to tell that leverages you as a hero. The next little insight is around something I call disruption. Okay, disruption is all around us. I took this photo at Robson and Burrard. Now, a number of years ago, because you'll probably recognize this has now been replaced, but I thought this was rather iconic of disruption. We've got the old HMV sign, obviously has been taken down, 
but in the corner over here, not even illuminated, is the little iPod sign. And I thought, what does this say? This little iPod basically disrupted an entire industry, the music industry. It was a symbol of disruption. HMV got caught, not monitoring what was happening, not being able to respond in a timely manner. Disruption can be extremely uh, a positive thing if you're ahead of it, but if you're caught behind it, that can be a real problem. There's been lots of talk about newspapers. Newspapers are being disrupted. Okay? I don't think newspapers are going away anytime soon, but I do think the model that they're based on is broken. The model is advertising supported. Let's sell the ads, that will give us the, the money to be able to produce the paper. Simply, we are going into a much more mixed mode of our media consumption. So the model to make them financially viable has to change. There's an industry, it's not going away, but it needs to respond to disruption. I love this quote. Revenue from circulation exceeded revenue from advertising for the first time ever. New York Times 2013. There is a paper that got ahead of things. They've put up a paywall. Now we can argue all we want. They're the New York Times. They can kind of do this because they have that kind of publishing clout. But they got ahead of the disruption and they're figuring out a way to monetize good writing and that people will appreciate. Anyone got an ad in one of these? I hope not. Yellow Pages. It's simply another example of disruption at work. Now, yes, Yellow Pages can still be valuable for certain target segments, but very quickly that is becoming less and less. Simply Google for search, Yelp for rating have replaced this. And as we go into being more and more a mobile device society, that will become even more so. So disruption, these are some examples that they didn't get ahead of it. But here's an example of a company that did get ahead of it. This is Tesco. Tesco is a grocery store in South Korea. Okay? They were solidly second in their category. What they did is they took photos of shelves, shelves of food, and they put them on the side of a subway terminal. They made it so you could scan with a QR code, check out the food, check out the prices, and then you could have it ordered, you could order it, and you could have it delivered to your home that night. Now in South Korea, this works. They're a very, very heavily wired society. Close enough together, they could arrange you know, all the delivery. But there's a company that said, let's, let's disrupt everything. If you think about it, we don't have to stock the shelves. We don't have to pay people to stock the shelves. No food is going bad. Promotion, they got so much publicity and promotion around this, uh, written up and um, on, uh, in the news, they hardly had to, to buy any kind of promotion. The pricing model, completely different. It's all gone electronic. You're just scanning. And, and, and cashing out on your mobile device. Here's another great example. I love this. For the Olsen Hotel in Melbourne, on the off chance, has anyone been there? I'll take Melbourne first, then I'll take Molson. Olsen, I should say. Okay, Melbourne. So the Olsen Hotel is a really interesting hotel. Uh, it's kind of in the artsy district, Melbourne. And they decided to challenge a, a convention in their industry. Traditional checkout is what, 11? Okay, check in is three. So in between 11 and three, they're cleaning your room, they're doing that kind of thing. So they said, well, what if we just let people stay? If there's no one coming in behind them, why don't we let them stay? So what they've got is you call down in the morning and you say, is anyone checking in? And they say no, and you go, great, I can stay for free. Absolutely free. They're giving away nights. Now, they call it the world's best overstay policy. <laughs> They've got a great video on their website of how this guy kind of morphs along and his hair gets longer and how he's lounging about. The reality is, is that most people don't have the ability to stay maybe more than one night. So it's not going to get abused. And it is a popular hotel, 
but by giving away one night, think about what they're doing from a promotions and sales standpoint. Number one, they didn't have to clean the room, so the staff don't have to, you know, you don't have that expense. But more importantly, they're enabling people to talk about them in a positive way. They put up a Facebook page. They say, the question, what did you do with your extra night in Melbourne? Phenomenal. People are talking, they're posting photos, they're bragging about it. The amount of money that this costs them to give away a night is peanuts compared to the free publicity and the goodwill that they gain around this. Okay, there's a company that got ahead of their industry. They disrupted things. They said, why do you have to check out? What if we changed one of the models around what we offer? Okay, great sales technique. It's about storytelling. It's about getting people to talk about your brand in a positive way. Anyone heard of Dollar Shave Club? Okay, few. If you haven't, who hasn't heard of Dollar Shave? Okay, so good. All right, so there'll be a few people this is new to. So Dollar Shave Club was launched, I guess it's now about 18 months ago, uh, out, of, out of kind of the, the Silicon Valley, a lot of um, kind of investors that kind of started this up uh, down there. The whole premise is, let's take a category that has not been shaken up, frankly, in decades. Let's sell razors online. You can get a whole month's supply for a dollar. Now, I'm not going to say how good those razors are. You want to go for the deluxe, it'll be nine bucks. It's still cheap. You go online, you order your razors. You're all going, well, okay, this is like, what's so special about this? It's that they've disrupted the distribution, they've disrupted the pricing, they've disrupted the promotion. I'm going to play for you a video of how they promote this offering on their website. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and ten blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are going to ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors. We're also making new jobs. Alejandra, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. I know karate, I know jiu-jitsu, I drive like a gangster when I'm coming to see you. So, an irreverent approach to selling razors. The razors are still the same. This is making the companies like Schick and Gillette shake in their boots. 20, 000, or 20, excuse me, 20 million in sales last year. This year, they're on target. Uh, projections are 60 million. They're going to be getting into selling men's skincare product. And if you think about it, it makes complete and total sense. They're going to target a slightly older male, 50 and above for skin care. 50 year old guys are not necessarily going to go to the cosmetic counter at a store, but they'll sit on their computer and order it and have it come in a discreet delivery. Brilliant, brilliant idea. So they disrupted promotion. They did this all online initially. Then they've gone and strategically purchased TV spots in things like sporting events where they, they know that they can get a targeted audience uh, for their product. The distribution has been disrupted, the price has been disrupted, okay? So this example really demonstrates every category is open potentially for disruption with some creative thinking. It's not just the product that changes, it's the delivery mode. I'll go into my, you know, the four Ps, right? The product, the price, the place, the promotion, the packaging. So if it can be digitized, it can be disrupted. 
on some level, whether it's the product or whether it's the distribution and the promotion side of things. So what I'd invite you to do is consider your businesses, your category. What could we do that disrupts, challenges convention? What is an accepted method that we deliver by or that we sell through? What could we do differently and get noticed for it?